Good evening, everyone. My name is David Elwood, and I'm the dean of the Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government here, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. I would just like to remind you to please turn off any cell phones. Uh, this is uh, technology advancing. The cell phones may well have been made in China. Nonetheless, uh, we'd like you to at least put them on vibrate so as not to interrupt things. Uh, it's terrific to see you all here for tonight's uh, Malcolm Wiener Lecture. We're blessed this year actually to have two. Uh, the other Malcolm Wiener lecturer uh, was uh, Mohammed Yunus, and we have an equally remarkable man to join us here tonight. Let me say a couple of words about Malcolm Wiener, who was unable to attend tonight. But this was established in 1989, and it represents uh, Mr. Wiener's interest in scholarship in international financial matters, including currency relationships, international monetary systems, and so forth. Past speakers have included, as I mentioned, Mohammed Yunus, but also Martin Wolf, uh, Sir Leon Britton, James Schlesinger, Helmut Kohl, Vaclav Kloss. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without Malcolm's generosity, and he is someone who has participated in the Kennedy School in a variety of ways. One of the most prominent is he uh, is the uh, support he, he endowed the Malcolm Wiener Center provided its support. I myself have been a Malcolm Wiener lecturer, and so it's a particular interest of mine. Um, but he's one of these people that has remarkable range of interests. Uh, he hates it when I say it, but he is truly one of the very few Renaissance men I know, not the least of which uh, is he studies things ranging from financial markets to Aegean civilizations in Minoan Crete, uh, and indeed receives uh, honorary degrees from places like uh, the University of Athens and um, others. So he is uh, an expert in the Bronze Age and he's a particular expert on the timing of things. And the timing of this lecture couldn't be more appropriate. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the speaker that we have tonight uh, is someone who has been an observer, a keen observer of Asia and the world for quite some time. Uh, he's been a journalist in Asia writing for both Reuters and the Financial Times for a combined total of nearly 20 years. And during his time, he's covered events ranging from the Japanese economic bubble, remember Japan, uh, to, uh, and its deflation, uh, second largest economy, uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, independence of Mongolia in 1991, uh, the rise of nationhood and of the five uh, former Soviet uh, Asian republics, uh, the China-Taiwan missile crisis, the Asian financial crisis, and certainly, uh, and as important as any of these things, China's emergence uh, as a power. He spent seven years as the China bureau chief for the Financial Times, and tonight uh, he'll be here talking about his recent book, China Shakes the World, A Titan's Rise and Troubled Future and the Challenge for America. He is indeed um, a remarkable thinker on this topic. Uh, it is for this book that he's received both Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award, um, and he's received many other awards uh, prior to that. Um, he has spoken at the World Economic Forum, uh, and he's been on numerous uh, radio, television, and other kinds of experience, uh, activities. Obviously, what is going on in China is reshaping the world, but as his title for this talk suggests, the question is, who is shaping who, and where does it all lead? I think nothing could be either more important or more timely than tonight's topic. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. James King. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Elwood, for that very kind introduction. Um, may I say how honored I am to be here at the Kennedy School of Government to deliver this uh, Malcolm Wiener lecture. Uh, Professor Wiener's uh, work on transitional economies, particularly that of the former Soviet Union, I think uh, should serve as an excellent inspiration for tonight's discussion on whether the West is integrating China or the other way around. When I look at uh, the people assembled here today, I can see several faces of uh, uh, longtime China experts, many of whom were my mentors for the last uh, two, dec two decades or so. So I can't imagine that my remarks will be too particularly penetrating to them, but um, I hope that they will serve as a basis for a discussion to follow. Uh, may I also say how welcoming and friendly I have found people in Boston since I arrived here last night. I, 
I, I assume that this is just the customary New England hospitality, <laughs> and it's got nothing to do with the recent feats of the Red Sox. Um, if you permit me, I will start with a personal reminiscence. In the mid-1980s, the Chinese foreign ministry had certain rituals which they used to use to uh, welcome and to bid farewell to foreign journalists who'd been accredited to Beijing. The parting ritual was a lunch at which the journalist would be given a plate emblazoned with a picture of the Great Wall. The wall, it was explained, was a symbol of friendship towards foreign peoples. <laughs> the welcoming ritual was also a lunch, and it was usually a fairly earnest affair. The incoming journalist would be informed of the relevant rules of regulations uh, which attended his accreditation. And then, in my case at least, and that of several other colleagues that I knew, he would be given a warning. And that was, always remember that whatever you write about China, it will not have the smallest effect on how our country develops. In my case, the veracity of this statement was borne out by subsequent reality. But I've sometimes pondered over the advice that I was given at that lunch. And in later years, I've come to view it as somewhat representative of the way that China has regarded its interaction with the outside world. The presence of foreign journalists at that time was required if China was to attract the foreign investment that was needed to develop its economy. Yet the authorities were also determined to handle us in a way that minimized our impact on the body, on the body politic rather in the same way that officials in the late 19th century used to say that foreign things could be used, but the essence of China must remain the same. <clears throat> or indeed, similar also to the way that mandarins in imperial times would absorb the technologies brought by European Jesuit missionaries and others, but seldom became believers. Such examples are, in my view, pertinent to the experiences of the last 29 years since Deng Xiaoping embarked upon the era of reform and opening. For most of this period, the story that Western journalists in Beijing focused on was how China's openness to the world was changing China. And indeed, there were many influences. I remember, for instance, the first time the Super Bowl was televised in China, and William Perry, the 308-pound Chicago Bears defensive lineman, became instantly known to millions of Chinese simply by his nickname, The Fridge. More enduringly, Beijing adopted a raft of free market economic reforms allowed hundreds of thousands of students to study abroad, relaxed restrictions on officially sanctioned religions, brought down tariff barriers, tempered its communist ideology, and pushed through a host of other changes aimed at making the country stronger economically. All of this was news, and it engendered in the West a hope that China through its engagement with the outside world, would come to more closely resemble the West. The idea among politicians and many others in the US and Europe was that China would be easier to deal with and a potentially less disruptive member of the international community if it was capitalist, if it upheld human rights, and as some optimists even hoped, if it became a Western-style democracy. In other words, if China could be integrated into the Pax Americana, then the US world order would survive and flourish. But serious doubts now attend this scenario. Jim Mann, in his recent book, The China Fantasy, frames the question of who, China or the West, 
is integrating whom. And this, in my opinion, is a particularly pertinent time to ask this question as projections of China's influence are spreading around the world. In fact, if you accept that roughly the first 25 years of the era of reform and opening were concerned with how the world has been changing China, then for the last few years at least, the story perhaps has rather been about how China is now changing the world. The price of energy and resources, the global outlook for inflation, the future of trade imbalances, the fate of the US dollar, Asia's business cycle, and much else will all, to a certain extent anyway, be made in China. And there are more concrete manifestations too. Just in the last few days, the world's largest bank, which by the way is now the state-owned Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, spent more than 5 billion US dollars to buy a 20% stake in the Standard Bank of South Africa, a move that seems certain to accelerate China's commercial engagement on the African continent. As China's influence spreads, many in the West worry that it will challenge the current world order. These concerns stem largely from two aspects of China's nature. The first is that in spite of widespread economic reforms, the country does not yet have a genuine free market. The commanding heights of the economy remain largely the preserve of the state. Banking, insurance, securities broking, fund management, steel, autos, oil, gas, coal, power generation and transmission, publishing, education, te television, telecoms, ports, airports, and several other sectors are all dominated by state-owned oligopolies. Barriers to private or foreign company entry into these sectors are either high or insurmountable. The financial system is open only in a limited way to foreign participation, and despite several promises, the capital account remains largely closed and the renminbi is not yet a fully convertible currency. In addition to this, there are several example, examples of sectors in which the government is simultaneously an industry regulator and the owner of the largest player in that industry. The lack of an independent legal system means that the central or local governments can wield considerable power through published or private directives. This means that beyond the relatively free export-oriented manufacturing sector, the government remains the big boss. And thus companies, both Chinese and foreign, spend a great deal of time on building better relations with officials. The idea, which was popular a few years ago, that China's entrance into the World Trade Organization would create a transparent, rules-based business climate has turned out to be fanciful. A recent publication by the EU Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, which details market access complaints in a book which runs to more than 300 pages, tends to support this view. The other aspect of China's nature that makes it problematically problematic to deal with, from a Western perspective at least, is that it remains largely unreformed politically. Far from adopting Western-style democracy, the Chinese Communist Party is probably more powerful now than at any time since the 1949 revolution. The idea that economic reform would bequeath an irresistible pressure on Beijing to overhaul its political system has not been borne out. In fact, the party's continued control over parts of the economy has strengthened it, 
as growth has averaged 10.5% a year over the last 29 years. By several yardsticks, the party's ability to project its power overseas is also growing. The state's stash of foreign exchange reserves now totals over 1.4 trillion US dollars. The China Investment Corporation, which has some 200 billion US dollars allocated from those reserves, is starting to scour the world for investment opportunities. The Social Security Fund, another separate reserve of, of state cash, is, according to today's Financial Times, considering investments in some of the big US private equity firms. And lastly, SASAC, a state organization which oversees some 160 of the largest state-owned corporations, has been building a fund of its own. And this may also be used in time to come, uh, partly for overseas acquisitions. Such are the economic trappings of the Communist Party. But of course, its power does not spring solely from its wealth. Increased spending on the security forces within China and strengthening of the People's Liberation Army have furnished the party with greater control at home in spite of a rising tide of civil unrest and an ability to project its military power prowess increasingly far from its shores. As China's international influence has grown, the party and the government it controls have invested considerable effort in managing relations with the United States. In this, there are several areas of benign cooperation, such as the joint efforts to persuade North Korea to drop its nuclear ambitions. But equally, there are many cases in which China's intentions appear as a counterpoint to US power. Beijing has held military exercises with Russia, and it has participated with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a grouping of Central Asian countries plus Russia, to call for a deadline for the withdrawal of US military bases in that region. China has also fostered close relations with some states that the US considers rogue. Iran, Sudan, and Venezuela are examples. And in Africa, the conduct of China's diplomacy, and especially in the lack of conditions that it attaches to its concessionary lending there, Beijing is seen by the US and by multilateral organizations as undermining decades of work. It may well be that some of the challenges China throws up to the West are not premeditated, but merely the products of a different political heritage. One example of this is the issue of the G7 or the, or the G8. This grouping was established as a club of industrialized democracies to discuss the stewardship of the world economy and currency alignments. But without China as a member, this grouping is facing obsolescence because the discussion of trade imbalances and currencies is hardly meaningful without Beijing's participation. The differences that exist between China and much of the rest of the world are often exacerbated by a, a rise of domestic nationalism reinforced by a steady drumbeat of propaganda. Chinese youth are still taught of the injustices and the humiliations visited upon them by foreign powers during a century of shame. Japan comes in for particularly strong criticism with school textbooks containing several references to Japanese devils. In fact, the successes of the last 29 years are often held up as evidence that the Chinese people are prevailing in spite of historical foreign aggression and lingering malevolence. Rarely do official newspapers and television acknowledge the contribution of overseas investors, aid donors, and trade partners 
to China's economic transformation. However, there are signs that the nationalism may be tempered as Beijing grows more mindful of its reliance on the world around it. In history, China could afford to dwell largely within itself, its economy sustained by its own size and sophistication. But now, the world's most populous nation depends for much of its oil, gas, metal ores, markets and technologies on its interactions with foreign powers. Partly in recognition of this, Beijing has launched a soft power charm offensive aimed at winning friends and access to resources across the globe. The apogee of these efforts will be on display in August next year in Beijing when the capital hosts the Olympic Games and some 20,000 foreign journalists from all over the world will descend to assess the progress of Asia's rising giant. It may be that what they write will have some effect on China's future. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. We, we have time for questions. As is our style, there are four microphones located. There's one right here, one part way up the steps here, another there, one there. We'll just rotate around. Now, just a couple of the standard ground rules. Many of you will already know it. You should just line up at the microphones if you want to speak, if you want to ask questions. Uh, the first ground rule is you should, uh, good questions have three elements. One is the person identifies him or herself. Uh, second, the question contains but one thought and ends with a question mark. One short thought and ends with a question mark. Uh, and uh, finally, as I say, it has only one, one question associated with it. So please uh, we'll just line here up at the microphones and I'll just rotate around, starting right here. Please identify yourself and ask the question. Hi, I'm Ding Lan Xu. Uh, Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, do you have any observation of the uh, party congress, which was uh, recently closed? Uh, yes, I have some observations there. My first one is that the party congress is terribly important uh, for the people who reside within the Communist Party, but it's not of huge significance, at least the significance of it is not apparent yet, uh, either to the outside world or to the rest of people in China. Um, I think, in fact, uh, this party congress has, um, m is much less important than some of the big macro things which are going on in China. And I'd just like to highlight one of them. I wanted to put it in my speech, but uh, because of time constraints, I couldn't. And that is that even though the Communist Party at its center is becoming more and more powerful, as I said, what is also happening is that localities, um, governments and Communist Party um, bureaus in local areas, are becoming more and more disobedient to the center. And this is creating a fragmentation of China's authoritarian rule. And this has big implications for the world because it means that in very important areas such as the environment, uh, such as enforcing uh, intellectual property rights, uh, such as enforcing a slowdown of economic growth, for instance, the central government is unable, or increasingly unable, to make its writ run true throughout the, the, um, the, the whole country. So I would say that even though uh, the party congress was important and we saw a new generation, a second, uh, another generation of leaders being put into place in the, in the Politburo, what's more important than what happened in Beijing is what's happening in the country all around Beijing. I just finished that by saying that one observation of the new lineup is that it's a much more consensual uh, lineup than perhaps in, in some eras of the past, certainly more so than the era of Deng Xiaoping, which was obviously the era of a strong man, but also perhaps more so than at times during the Jiang Zemin tenure on power. Uh, I would say that Hu Jintao now has to build coalitions, share influence with many of the other top people in the Politburo. And that 
may be good in some ways, um, but I feel it will also have the effect of exacerbating the problem of decentralization of power and local disobedience that I just mentioned. Thank you. Right here. Hello there, my name is Rachel Esplin and I'm a sophomore at the college studying East Asian studies. And my question to you relates to the last comment that you made and also to an article in this month's Foreign Policy magazine about the upcoming 2008 Olympics and the, the pending dissent of foreign journalists. And what, how do you feel, based on your experience as a journalist in China, um, the Beijing government is going to confront this um, challenge of foreign journalism? Um, how is the censorship going to be manifested? Are they going to be successful? And, and also, what changes do you think might be brought about in, by those foreign journalists? Uh, thank you very much. It's a very good question. I think um, th this Olympics has, uh, has brought out a remarkable uh, level of openness um, within the Chinese government. Uh, you probably know that um, earlier, a few months ago, the foreign ministry brought out a new rule which said that foreign journalists currently accredited to China can travel wherever they like without getting prior permission. We used to have to apply um, the rule was we had to apply 10 days before we went, but actually most people bent the rules. But anyway, we used to have to apply before we went anywhere in China. Now you can travel all over the country without receiving official um, prior permission. And that has also been extended to the 20,000 journalists who are going to be there during the Olympics. So this is a totally unprecedented moment of openness to the Western media since the uh, revolution in 1949. Um, and it's driven by the fact that China wants to show itself as a, a modern, all accepting, open, transparent society um, for, for various reasons. It wants to brand itself alongside countries like the States and um, big powers in Europe. Um, but, of course, when things go wrong, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, in 2005, according to official figures, there were 87,000 incidents of unrest in different parts of China. They were all localized, but nevertheless they happened. If a whole crowd of foreign journalists descend upon an area of China which is experiencing convulsions of unrest, will at the time of the Olympics, and if the cameras are therefore turned onto this, rather than onto China's coming out party in Beijing, then what will the central government do? That is a question that nobody can answer. But it's a real potential dilemma, I think, for the, for the authorities. And I just make one other point there. My hope is that the Olympics go really well. Of course, because I like China, because I lived there a long time, because I think the authorities and all the people are really putting an awful lot of effort into making this a really wonderful games. So that's my hope. It's also my hope because if something was to go wrong, in other words, if there was an incident of unrest somewhere and then a horrible crackdown which made it onto the TV screens all over the world, I feel there's a danger that China could once again crawl back into its more authoritarian shell. Yeah. Right up here. Um, hi, uh, my name is John Chen. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was curious if you could elaborate on your interpretation of China's increasing relationship with uh, certain states of the Middle East, not only economically, but also culturally, politically. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm not a great expert on China in the Middle East. Um, I think um, what I can say is that a lot of China's foreign policy these days is driven by its appetite. Um, its overtures to Sudan, to Iran, um, to Venezuela, those countries that I mentioned, are not, in my opinion, driven by a sense of or a desire or to make things difficult for America. Um, and the same is true in the Middle East. I think China is moving into the Middle East as much as it can um, in order to ensure its supply of oil. That's it. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, of course, that brings it into a very complicated area, and a lot of people are watching it somewhat warily. 
Um, but I, I, I don't feel that, that China has a malevolent intent. I just feel that there is one constant in today's China, and that is that its appetite is so enormous, it simply must be sated. And its diplomats and its commercial officials scour the world uh, really in a single-minded attempt to try to, to ensure that it, it can get access to resources that it needs. Yeah, thank you. Right up here. Yeah, I just want to follow up on what you ended up with. Uh, my name is Ali Mackie, and I'm an alumnus of the school. And listening to several interviews of Chinese officials recently, um, some have pointed out that 60% or more of their exports are in fact, exports of multinationals based in China, and that only 40% of it comes from Chinese farms. And second, for long, for long periods of time, we've heard you know, Wall Street investment uh, uh, types arguing not to put any kind of political conditionalities on investments, but to seek the highest return for their beneficiaries or their stakeholders. So when you point out that in Africa, the Chinese don't put political conditionalities, that sort of goes against the grain of what most financial folks, even in the US, would say, would, say would, would not be prudent. Um, so my question to you is, given that China is gonna be very focused on internal issues for quite some time, and given that it has a significant role to play in terms of environmental issues and other issues. How should the West engage uh, China? Should it look at it as some Chinese officials have argued uh, is being conjured up as a, a, another yellow peril? Or should it be looked at as a, as a society struggling to meet the needs of its population uh, and grasping at ways to do it? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very, very important question. It's a very difficult one to answer, and I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to one's personal uh, feelings. My, um, my sense is that China is indeed a country internally focused. It's grappling with enormous kind of tectonic forces that are, that are underway there. One of them, for instance, is the need to create 24 million new jobs every year. By the way, that is equivalent to more than solving all of Europe's long-term unemployment problem every single year. So, um, you know, you can see that the government that runs China really has a lot on its plate. Um, the, my feeling would be that the only way to deal with China is, first of all, to recognize that foreigners for about the last 500 years have been trying to change China, and they've all failed. Uh, there's a wonderful book written by Jonathan Spence called To Change China, which uh, sets out um, you know, several of these attempts. Um, and so I think it's time that Western governments, of course, um, living by their own standards and their own, um, their own principles, et cetera, on human rights, but nevertheless, desisted from putting the aim of changing China at the center of their China policies. I would say that the time has come for a much more reactive policy towards China, observing the Communist Party, accepting that the Communist Party is going to be there for decades, and, um, and, and worrying about how to integrate and work with that entity, because that is going to be the entity that rules China um, for the foreseeable future. I would say that might be point number one. And point number two might be um, to recognize what you have, uh, have pointed out. And that would be that China is undergoing enormous um, change and problems. Many of those problems are not under control. Uh, and therefore, it needs assistance. Um, and it needs open markets. And it needs forbearance uh, from the Western world. I think the current resurgence of protectionism that you see both in America and in Europe and in China um, is particularly dangerous. If we get into that kind of tit-for-tat uh, sort of battle with each other, then I think we're all going to be losers. Yeah. Right here. 
Thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to reading your book. My name is Carol. I'm a first year um, public policy student at the Kennedy School, and I'm from China. And uh, my question to you is, with the 1.3 billion uh, population, two-thirds of that farmers not equipped with the proper education and uh, critical thinking ability, what's the best way to, what's the most effective way for the government to open up its media, given that the government putting um, stability as its priority, and given that there are a lot of foreign media is very hostile, you know, that have a very hostile stand against um, China right now? Um, that's a good question. It's interesting that you talk about the rural areas and all of the problems that exist in rural China, and then you juxtapose that with media freedom. Um, my, it probably won't surprise you to learn that my point of view on this is one that media freedom does not jeopardize social stability. In fact, media freedom can strengthen social stability if it's handled in the right way. Of course, there will be rules for the media, but um, my feeling is that with media freedom, you can gain transparency. And with transparency, you can gain local government acquiescence to the laws that those people are supposed to abide by, which is one of the biggest problems and the greatest source of unrest at the moment in China. So I feel actually uh, that if the government of China was to free the media, you might have fewer instances of unrest because those local officials will be held accountable publicly to their actions. Um, but um, I know that several people in China wouldn't agree with that point of view. I don't think you do. But um, uh, that, that, to me, is the way perhaps they should, they should think about it. Let me uh, take the privilege of the chair to ask you a quick question. Uh, you've covered Japan as well as, as China. Uh, it's an interesting uh, relationship at this stage since it's becoming increasingly integrated economically and yet political tensions, uh, if anything, are rising simultaneously. Where do you, how do you see that playing out and is that in some sense a model of what we might expect with other nations vis-a-vis uh, -vis China uh, and the, in Asia, in this case, we have the two strongest economies? So where does it lead? Very good question. I think, you know, um, there has been this extraordinary situation of economic convergence between China and Japan and political divergence at the same time. And you just wonder when something is going to give and the souring political relationship is going to spill over into the economic field. But so far, it hasn't. Um, if you look at the future of China-Japan on the political side of things, I would say that it's extremely dangerous. Um, I think this is a genuine potential flashpoint. Um, and I can't see it getting any better. It seems that public opinion, um, also goaded on by the Japanese government, is turning more and more nationalist in Japan. And um, there doesn't seem to be very um, kind of open debate in Japan about how to deal with both their historical problems with China and the current realities of growing tensions. And in China, the same thing is happening. The Chinese government is stoking up more and more anti-Japanese feeling, um, it seems to me, as the years and months go by. And I really feel that this is um, a very, very dangerous uh, situation. Um, I, I don't know how it's going to end. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, sir. Ryan Baum, MPA student. China and Taiwan, what is your prediction on the future of that relationship? That's a big one. <laughs> um, OK. So let's just put it in a little bit of perspective first. Um, the China-Taiwan relationship is actually a triangular relationship because the States is in there as well, as you very well know. Um, the, at the moment, in Taiwan, you have a couple of significant forces. The first is that the majority of the Taiwanese people do not want independence or reunification with China. They want a maintenance of the status quo, which is de facto independence. Um, in China, you have a situation where the government has made it absolutely front and center of their policy to try every way possible to bring Taiwan back into the fold. 
But significantly, uh, the government seems to be taking a more long-term view of this quest than it, than it has perhaps about five years ago. And then you have the US in the middle. And the US, its role, as you probably know, under the Taiwan Relations Act is to come to the aid of Taiwan in its defense against potential aggression from China, which the Chinese government views as a kind of cover for Taiwanese continued Taiwanese de facto independence. In other words, if the states is standing there, the Taiwanese feel bold enough to remain independent and um, not engage in rapprochement and moves that would towards reconciliation and reunification with China. So that's the sort of complicated knot of issues that you've got there. Uh, if you're asking me to see how it will play out, you know, anything I would say would be uh, rather speculative. But um, as you've asked, uh, I feel I should say that over time, I think the economic convergence between Taiwan and China uh, will create greater and greater pressure for a movement towards reconciliation with China, leading towards some kind of accommodation on reunification. I frankly don't see it going in the opposite direction. I don't see um, the Taiwanese populace voting for independence. I think they've realized now that that will cause uh, a military option against Taiwan. Right up here. Uh, thank you, Matthew Perkins from the Harvard Business School and formerly of the British government. Um, my question is really around climate change and other international fora. China became the largest emitter of carbon dioxide last year, and it's certainly a huge benefactor from international trade expansion, yet it's shown a very small leadership role, taken a very small leadership role in uh, Kyoto, post-Kyoto negotiations and in the Doha round. Why do you think that is, and what can be done to change that? Why did it take a small leadership role, or why is it not doing more? I guess both. OK. Um, Right, okay. I think it's, a, it's really, probably there is no single bigger issue facing the world at the moment than China's attitude towards the environment, in, in my view. Uh, and that is because um, at the moment, China is burning about 2 billion tons of coal a year. Um, and at the current rate of economic growth, it'll burn another billion tons in, I can't remember exactly how many years, but less than a decade. So what we're facing if China continues this trajectory, this type of energy consumption is a, I would say, an environmental crisis without parallel. Um, already, those of us who live in Beijing, and I do, uh, you can see that the air quality is extremely poor. Um, not to mention the problems of northern China running out of water and of pollution in most of the rivers and water courses throughout the whole country. So we, we already have an environmental crisis in China. This crisis, in my opinion, will get worse because at least 70% of energy generation still comes from coal. That is the cheapest source. Most of the owners of uh, local power companies are local governments who have little interest in investing in environmentally friendly technology. And therefore, this problem, I think, will accelerate and it will get a lot worse. When it comes, when you juxtapose that situation with China in the international arena trying to be responsible, trying to, you know, cooperate with other powers to bring down the level of pollution in the world, you have a clear conflict. Um, and my feeling is that if you want me to predict again, um, that the government will not be able to accede to many of these international treaties. I mean, Kyoto is one, but there'll be others in the future. It just simply won't be able because its domestic situation is only tenuously under its control. Right up here. Good evening, Mr. King. Uh, my name is Mike Zhang, and I also come from the uh, capitalist breeding institution across the river known as the Harvard Business School. Um, my question to you is the, the Chinese government pace, places a great deal of value on social stability. And uh, in the last year, the Chinese stock market and specifically the Shanghai Composite Index has risen almost a hundredfold. Much of that is ordinary Chinese families pouring their life savings into the market. Do you foresee a soft landing for the stock market? And if not, 
what do you think the uh, social repercussions might be? I'm doing three predictions in a row now. Um, <laughs> if I knew the answer to that one, I'd be rich, I suppose. But, um, um, well, I mean, it looks like a bubble to me. Um, as you say, it's, it's risen dramatically. Um, I also find it quite amusing when you're traveling around in Beijing, and I, I often take taxis, and if you ask the taxi drivers their feeling about the stock market, they will tell you categorically that it will not fall before the Olympics. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so I think you've got an interesting situation here of a communist government defying capitalist gravity. Um, so, um, and I, I don't know how it'll work out, you know, either before or after the Olympics, because ultimately the stock market doesn't obey um, Beijing's, you know, policy directives. Um, at some stage, it seems likely to me that it will fall. It reminds me uh, rather of uh, the Taiwan stock market bubble in the early 90s. Um, and when it does, uh, I think it could be very messy, actually. I think it could be a big blow to a lot of people. Yeah. Right here. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ying. I'm an MPP student here in Kennedy School, and I'm from China. And I would like to ask a question as one of the very confusing Chinese new generation. I was actually born in the year you first went to China, and my grandparents suffered World War, World War II, and my parents experienced the opening and reform, which they were able to send me here today. Mm -hmm. However, the world to us seemed to have changed a lot. From when we were a kid, China's international image was more an enclosed, uh, less developed country, till now, constantly under the spotlight with a lot of issues debated, or even as you mentioned in your book, that maybe the world was even close the door to China. So how would you see the Chinese public, particularly the new generation, will react to this trend? And with your Western, with the Western wisdom, how should they react? Thanks. How would they, re sorry, how would they react to which trend? To the, to the, to the change, the, the Chinese, uh, the, the change, the trend, the, the uh, Chinese the, image in the world, and all this. Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 the change of the image in, in which way? Um, it, is From 20 years ago till now. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Um, right. Um, thank you. I, I, I think, um, oh, first of all, I don't, I'm sure I don't have any Western wisdom um, on, on issues of, uh, of China. I mean, um, I will say about generational change, and I think it's interesting that, that you were born in, in the year that I went to China. That, that certainly makes me feel a little old. But uh, um, um, I would say about generational change in China that it is breathtakingly quick. Um, uh, you know, in my office, in the office that I work in now, there's about 150 people, and many of them are in their 20s, some are in their early 30s, and they tell me that they feel a generational gap um, as a 30-year-old to a 25-year-old, and a 25-year-old will feel a similar gap to a 20-year-old. And I just think that it's so typical of the way that everything in China is happening at warp speed. Um, this place is throwing out new generations every five years. Um, but um, in, in the question of, um, uh, if I understood it correctly, of, uh, of the, how, how, sorry, how the West would react to, you're going to have to prompt me again, I'm afraid. Oh, well, I was just asking, how do you think the Chinese public, the Chinese new generation, should react or should respond to this trend of change? change? of China's image or China's, you know, all the changes in the country. Um, yes. With so many uh, controversial or so many different opinions about yes. China's rights. Well, it's, it's, it's rather difficult to, um, to imagine all of the different permutations that that would cover. But um, I suppose as a general comment, I, I might say that um, these days, the the young people in China, it seems to me, are very concerned with material advancement. Uh, there's a, a very good book I've just read in Chinese called Lost in Prosperity. And uh, it's by a Chinese author in Beijing. And it deals with this sense of disorientation that many young people in China have today because it seems the single goal in their life seems to be material enrichment. 
And I think, you know, it's rather similar to um, Mark Twain's Gilded Age. You know, there was a similar period in US history. So I suppose all I can say is that over time, I imagine that this will balance itself out and people will look for other sustenance, more spiritual sustenance, psychological sustenance, friendship, um, communities uh, that will balance out this almost monolineal reliance on getting, getting richer that you have today. I'm not sure if that quite answers, but that's the best I can do. Thank you, right here. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Jack Lee. I'm a pro Visiting scholar to HR program at Kennedy School. Uh, as a, a journalist of the Reuters and the Financial Times, you have covered uh, many significant events, including uh, Taiwan-China missile crisis in 1996 and the uh, Taiwan's uh, presidential elections. Um, the, in the, in the uh, party congress uh, documents, the China chairman, Hu Jintao, expressed a mild and moderate tone toward Taiwan policy. However, uh, the Taiwan government is going to hold a referendum of Taiwan's entry, re-entry to United Nations. And what's your observation and prediction of the impact uh, on the uh, referendum, you know, uh, of the, uh, uh, on the across relationship in the future? Mm, thank you very much. Um, I think that you know, your first point is the, mo the more important point, um, and that is that in the, in the documents of the 17th Party Congress and in previous statements, the government, uh, the current government of China has shown that it's willing to take a longer term view of the Taiwan issue, that it's not setting a deadline for, for reunification, and that it's actually toned down some of the bellicose language that it was using before, and it's now got a charm offensive towards Taiwan, and several Taiwanese politicians are being invited over to the mainland. And you know the whole tenor of the way China is approaching Taiwan has changed. That is more important, I think, than this referendum uh, that you're mentioning. Of course, that will be an irritant, but I would say that it won't be um, decisive. Uh, you know, I think that the mainland policy towards Taiwan will remain Relative, relatively accommodative um, going forward. Thank you. I'm sorry, we have to, thank you. All right, Pierre. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Li. Uh, I'm the Li Guangyao Fellow of this school. Uh, my question is, uh, now the Chinese government raised a new concept of building a harmonious international society toward the international political relationships. How do you think of this concept? Thank you. Um, I, I think it's an excellent concept. Um, um, it's, um, and I think it's much needed. Um, you know, I, I mentioned in my, in my remarks that uh, there is, in my view, a rise of domestic nationalism in China. And you can see that in the economic field. And you can see it in the daily life field. Uh, you can see that some uh, foreign acquisitions of Chinese companies have been stalled or prevented from going ahead, and several other things. But more important than that, I think, is the way that Chinese perceive foreigners and foreigners perceive Chinese. This is a very soft thing. You, won't really, you can't really measure this. Nobody will be able to do a reliable poll on this. But as a foreigner who's lived in China now for 16 years, um, I do think it's almost the most important issue of all. Um, I think that there is a lot of propaganda um, which the Chinese government teaches its people, which, although true, is not balanced. And I feel that balance needs to be injected into this, and foreigners need to be uh, described in a way which takes account of the problems of history, but also takes account of the contribution that they, foreigners have made in China over the last 30 years. I think that's terribly important. And I also think it's important for China, because as Chinese people go out into the world, 
the impression they make on the people that they meet will have an effect on China's ability to access resources, to buy banks, to, you know, to, to interact in the global economy. It will be important, I think. And if all Chinese going out into the world think that foreigners are somehow aggressive towards them or have you know, com uh, contributed solely to their humiliations of the past, then that may, may become a barrier to the acceptance of those Chinese people as they go into, into the rest of the world. I think it's a very important point. Afraid we don't have time for only two more questions, right here. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Brian from uh, Harvard Business School and also uh, from China. Uh, I just have one question. I um, uh, feel like 20 years ago, there's this, say, communism ideology in China, but as the market opening up, there's this ideology has been fading away. And then there's sort of nothing new coming in to occupy sort of people's ideology. People just busy sort of making money, follow down this direction, and you know, the, the richer, the better. But I, I really feel like, you know, if, if that's people's only goal, then the society's kind of sort of lack of uh, content. And also, it's, I feel like it's pretty chaotic over there. What's your view as sort of, of as a foreigner just seeing this 20 years transformation, and where do you see China's ideology will go forward? Uh, will that from, you know, abroad or that will develop within China? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's another very good question, and I'm really probably quite unable to answer. Um, I, I think that in terms of political ideology, uh, China is less and less ideological. As I mentioned, there is this nationalistic ideology which is now growing. Um, but um, the people themselves are basically concerned with the need to get on and make money and improve their position in society and care for their kids and their parents and their retirement, etc. So they are very much focused on making money, as we discussed earlier. Um, but how all of that will develop or how it will gel in the future is very, very difficult to tell. But I do think that it will depend to a significant extent on how China is treated by the rest of the world. I think if uh, the West was to close its doors on China, the US and Europe, uh, to throw up protectionist barriers to make life very difficult for Chinese companies trying to go out, then that could have a big backlash um, on Chinese sentiment towards the rest of the world and on the way the government looks at political control. And as I mentioned um, right at the beginning, I think, um, if the Olympics goes badly, that could have a bad uh, um, uh, reaction too. But let's hope that none of these things will happen. I assume that uh, Chinese people will develop into people very much like yourself, um, you know, open-minded and uh, thoughtful and accepting of, uh, of the world around them. Maybe we'll try two more questions right here. <clears throat> My name is Samuel Choi, and I'm a Chinese American, and I represent a humanitarian organization. Um, I have a question regarding Darfur. Um, you mentioned China's soft power charm offensive. Um, and at the same time, the inter international community, um, especially the Security Council, the United States, is trying to integrate China to become a more responsible stakeholder. And given the evidence that China is a huge stakeholder in Darfur, or in, in Sudan, um, with evidence of investments, um, and just the, my question is, um, how do you see um, the world integrating China into a more responsible role, or is it the other way around? Uh, well, I think Darfur is a very good example. Um, as you know, Mia Farrow and uh, a couple of other Hollywood stars had a campaign to brand the Beijing Olympics the Genocide Olympics. And the reasoning behind that was that Chinese actions um, support for the Sudanese government were contributing to the genocide in Darfur. That was her reasoning. Um, and when this news became public, when the Chinese government heard of this, they, I don't know if it was connected, perhaps it wasn't. I really have no proof either way. But after that, they did begin to take uh, certain measures uh, within the UN. Um, and they are supporting, I think, a couple of overtures right now um, including the sending of peacekeepers, am I right about that, um, to Darfur. So I do think that engaging with China, bringing it into the international community, allowing it to hold things like the Olympics, where it is a stakeholder you know, connected to the rest of the world, will um, create a pressures for China to behave 
in a much more internationally responsible manner. This will be the last question. Hello, I'm Rosabeth Moss Cantor. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School, and I want to ask a related question, because you talked about the large amount of capital that we know is going to come out of China looking for investment elsewhere. I'm sure you're also aware that there are many programs in which people here at Harvard are teaching Chinese executives current and future, so we are trying to impose our values. On the other hand, I hear a huge fear on the part of Western executives, particularly in Europe, that if, if Chinese companies, meaning really government owned or government related companies, take over European companies, and they think that's inevitable, that they will immediately lower the standards because there's a great deal of pride in high social and environmental standards, and there's a perception of essentially amorality on the part of the Chinese government. Now, there may be a different business community arising in China. We don't know that yet. Is that a reasonable fear? Um, that's a very good question. I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of concern. Uh, there, there was certainly that kind of concern when the China Development Bank bought that stake in Barclays in the UK. There was a lot of media comment that this was going to undermine the corporate governance of Barclays, etc. Um, but overall, I think that the more pertinent issue is whether or not these state investment funds and the big Chinese state companies, such as Sinuk, which tried to buy Unical here in the States in 2005, whether or not those companies are operating on a commercial basis. In other words, are they getting concessionary financing? Are they, um, is their com um, you know, corporate governance commercial, or do they actually report to somebody who is primarily a functionary of the Communist Party? In, in, in most cases, it is that, the latter case. I think those are, 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 are really concrete issues, but I fully expect that the issues that you raise will be commented on by the medias of, um, you know, in, in the West. And are they justified? I think it's a case-by-case -case issue. You know, I think it, they might be justified in some cases, but in others, probably not. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Terrific. I'll have you know he's wearing a tie that looks like a baseball diamond for all the world, so it's quite appropriate. And we did, after all, give him a big parade in Boston. What more could you ask? So uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh, have a safe trip home.